Good morning, everyone. If you could find your way to your seats, we're going to get started here. Um, say good morning. Um, I'm Jennifer Weil, and I'm so glad that you're all here this morning. And um, appreciate your flexibility. Um, as we have powers back on, and um, also appreciate everybody's behind the scenes work uh, to make sure that we were still able to do a um, live broadcast. So we thank you, everybody that's joining us here this morning, and we're glad that you're here, and we're glad that um, some of you were able to watch us online as well, even through this um, power issue. Um, but welcome to you also. Um, if you haven't already, uh, we invite you to fill out a Connect card. Um, you'll find those uh, in the back of the seat in front of you. And um, just take it out of the chair, fill it out, uh, bring it to the Welcome Center um, for a gift. And if you're watching online, you can scan the QR code at the bottom of your screen. Uh, filling out that Connect card will enable you to receive our weekly newsletter and other communications. As you can see, there's something going on outside. Um, today is the church picnic. And yeah, woohoo! Uh, we would like to welcome all of you to join us. If you're a visitor, please come. There's plenty of food. Um, beautiful day to spend some time outside and get to know a few people. And um, just stay, eat, and just enjoy the day with us, please. Um, coming up next, registration for our host family program for young adults is currently happening. So right now, we're looking for individuals and families from the church that would be interested in spending time with a young adult. So this could be anything from getting together for coffee or inviting them over to your home um, to share a meal with you. And this could look, um, if this is something that you would like to do, um, out of the Connect Center, we have a sign-up sheet. Um, and even if you're just not sure and would like some more information, uh, feel free to sign up. Um, we're going to be continuing to have sign-ups for young adults for the host family um, in a couple weeks. Um, so the young adults will get to sign up in a couple weeks, but we're looking for host families now. Um, also coming up on September 24th, our Women's Fan into Flame event is coming up. Uh, that's on Tuesday at 7 p.m. on September 24th. Um, ladies, we will gather at the campfire and enjoy some warm treats while Celia Barber will share what the Lord has put on her heart. Um, it should be a wonderful evening, and we really hope that you can come. Um, and finally, our fellowship groups, our sign-ups are well underway, um, but they don't start until um, the week of September 15th, so you're, there's still time. It's not too late to sign up. Um, and before we end, Natalie Schaefer is going to share a little bit about uh, the Young Adult Fellowship Group and how that has impacted her faith. So Natalie could come up. Natalie, there she is. I'm like... <laughs> Good morning, Saving Grace Church. If you don't know me, I'm Natalie. I've been coming to this church since I was in high school, and now I'm at IUP. I'm a junior studying nursing for all the nursing majors over there. Um, for the past few weeks, we have been hearing a lot about these fellowship groups, and I know we've already had a little bit of sign-ups, but if um, you haven't signed up yet and you're still kind of on the fence whether or not you should join, hopefully I can sweat your decision. Joining a fellowship group can be um, an enriching experience for many people. It provides a sense of community and belonging, which can be valuable for young adults who are navigating these different life changes. As a college student, you tend to get consumed with studying, exams, meeting deadlines, so it can be pretty hard to find time to connect with God that is outside of church. That is why I decided to join the Young Adult Fellowship Group with Adam and Melissa Jones. I know with my schedule, I can pretty much make every meeting time, um, so that's also the reason why I wanted to join. It creates a support system where all these members can encourage and uplift each other. I'm so glad I joined this group because it not only helped me with my relationship with God, but also grow in my faith, and I became closer with some of the church body as well. 
Being a part of this group has made it so much easier to strengthen my walk with the Lord since I have such an encouraging group um, in my corner that also prays for me as well. I can say for myself that I've built more confidence as well. I've started inviting more people to church, different church activities, and also serving the church more. I never thought I would be up here on stage talking, but here I am. <laughs> Truthfully, I really can't think of a reason to not join the fellowship group, but if you have doubts, I hope that I persuaded you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Natalie, for sharing. And uh, with that, we call David up for sharing the message. Am I coming through now? All right. Thank you, everybody, for all of your flexibility this morning. There has been so many different things that have have gone on and taken place. I'm actually going to move this real quick because I don't think most of you over here want to look at that through, through my face. So that'll work for now, right? Um, thank you so much for your flexibility and everything. Uh, we are closing out Ecclesiastes this week. Um, and so we're just going to kind of jump into some of this stuff. Um, I want to talk to you today about remembering your creator. We're going to get to that. But how many of you have ever started a work project at home, or if you're younger, maybe your parents have started uh, a project in your house and things like that, and as you started that project, you discovered some other stuff that needed done or some things that were not so up to par or anything like that? How many of you have ever had that experience? Yeah, just about you know, most of us out there, even in apartments sometimes. You get in and it's like, oh my goodness, what did, what did they do here? Um, sometimes we find things that are underneath the surface that we have to kind of take a, a look at and maybe repair or fix. Now, an aging house sometimes begins to reveal to us the underlying issues that, that are underneath, right? And that's why it's important to have a foundation that is built on good building principles, okay? So example, for an example, in the last, or in the first year or two that I bought my house, I had actually um, discovered that my garage was leaking. And so I started looking into this, this issue in my house, and when I did, I found that they had built well, let me, let me give you a little bit of an explanation here, too. There's some steps that lead, lead up to my back door, and there's a garage kind of like right beside those steps, and then there's a roof that kind of covers the steps, okay? And they built this roof over the steps right on top of the roof of the garage, okay? So they built this roof. They just put the boards right on top of the shingles, right on top of everything else that holds this upper roof up. Okay, well, as I looked, no wonder it started leaking, right? There was, there was a root of the problem, and that root of the problem was actually hasty decisions. Ecclesiastes calls it, calls it foolishness, okay? The issue wasn't the fact that the boards, the, the boards that this thing was built on were halfway between the rafters of the roof below it and that the gravity and, and the weight of those boards were pushing down on the plywood of that roof and there was water pooling around that base because of all that weight on top. That wasn't, that wasn't the issue. It was the hasty decisions. There was no foundational support under that roof that it was resting on, okay? Sometimes we like to try and take the, the quick and easy route without considering the long-term consequences. Some people build their lives on shifting truths, like follow your heart. There are many ways to God. That grace is a license to sin. 
or that God, godly living brings prosperity. These are, these are not truths. These are shifting ideas that can bring some consequences in the long run. They aren't foundational truths. So just like constructing a house, we need to consider the building principles of living our lives, right? Uh, Ecclesiastes calls it life under the sun. The S-U-N, all right? The cool thing is that we know that the creator, we know the creator and the builder of life itself. We know who is the truth. So we need to build our lives under the sun, S-O-N. Okay, so there's, I want you to get these, these ideas. There's two ideas here. There's life under the sun, S-U-N, and life under the sun, S-O-N. If we start there, if we build our lives on the sun, S-O-N, we are on a sure foundation, one that will last forever. All right? Ecclesiastes has been encouraging us all summer to seek wisdom and avoid folly. Chapter 12 gives us three uh, simple objectives, I think, in this, in this chapter that will guide and help us to live a life that brings glory to God. So those three truths are this, and we're going to go through them as we, as we go through this. Uh, remember your creator. Forget your limitations. And follow the one shepherd. So those are what we're going to be talking about today. So let's look at remember your creator. We see it here in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 12. It says this, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which we will say, I have no pleasure in them. So verse 1 offers us the cornerstone or foundation on which we are to build our lives. Remember also your creator. Remember your creator. Remembering now is much more than just bringing something to mind, okay? Like making sure you get your homework done or not forgetting to put that letter in the mail. My wife Satin will attest to you that she will give me a a letter to mail and the mailbox is a hundred feet from our house and as I go up the driveway I'm thinking to myself I'm gonna put this in and how quickly I forget I cannot tell you how many times I have passed that mailbox and forgot to put the the letter in the box remembering in this verse is actually talking about more than just remembering to do something you see, it stirs in us a connection to the object. Remembering a loved one is, is part of this. Remembering your favorite vacation or the va favorite vacation destination. Remembering some of the greatest moments in your life. Right? There's a connection to it, it, it from an experience that you've had and a commitment and a desire to want to reconnect with that again. Ecclesiastes encourages us to remember our Creator. Make remembering a habit in our lives. Remember the first time you heard the gospel. Remember the place that, or the price that Jesus paid for you. Remember the way that God has helped you through difficult situations. See, there's a connection to our Savior in remembering in this way. Remember your Creator, the one who made you and everything that we know and understand. The word creator in this verse has a lot of meaning, and, and we can consider the depth of this word. We could consider it probably the rest of the service, but we need to, I just want to take a look at two quick aspects of God's being our creator. Um, one is his, is the fact that God is unsearchable. His, uh, he is our, an unsearchable creator and a continuous creator. Okay? 
His creativity is unsearchable, and it is continuous. Let's look at two quick verses that kind of uh, help to support this. Psalm 145, verse 3 says this, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. First of all, our creator is so great, he is limitless and unsearchable, okay? We will never fully understand all that he has done for us and what he is going to do for us, all right? This, this past weekend, last weekend, the, the youth, uh, the guys of the youth went on a, on a hiking trip. And we were out in the woods and we were, we were talking about the, the beauty around us and different things. And Ben Murphy actually mentioned at one point, he said, um, we could explore every inch of God's creation for eternity. And we will never run out of new places to discover never run out of new places to discover. We can continue. God's creativity is limitless. It's unsearchable. God is also creating new places in your life as well. Through circumstances, through situations that most of the time we can't even grasp of why we're in some of these situations. And we would be surprised to discover sometimes what God is doing. Sometimes we don't even know how we get to the place that we are in life. God understands and can help us through everything that we face, all that we go through. So no matter what condition you find yourself in, no matter how crazy your situation is, no matter how you have been built and put together to this point, he can restore you. We have to understand that sometimes when it rains, when we're trying to repair that roof on our house, that that rain could be maybe putting out a fire in another area or watering a garden that's going to produce fruit in another area of our life. And so we must trust God's work and his power that we've been talking about so much this morning. The second aspect, God's creativeness is also continuous. It continues, it keeps going. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God is, un, uh, is everlasting, and he does not grow faint or weary. Like Jason mentioned last week, from the beginning of creation, from the beginning to the end in Revelation, God is continuously with us. He's helping us in that life under sun. He is continually creating. His creativeness is continuous and it is infinite. How many of you have ever made the statement, wow, how am I ever going to get out of this one? Have you guys ever made that? I think a few of you probably have. I know I have. How in the world am I ever going to get out of this one? Um, then down the road, you look back and you made it through. You got through it, didn't you? Or something else happened, turned you in a different direction, you're in a different place in life now. Time and time again, the Lord has been faithful in my life and has either brought me through a tough situation or has helped me to understand the situation from a different perspective so that I could realize that maybe there was a different plan for my future. A plan that I could have never imagined on my own. God will continue to create a beautiful story that reveals his greatness and glorifies him. Which brings us to our second objective. Forget your limitations. Forget your limitations. 
the last part of verse 1 and the whole next section, verses 2 through 6, that we're, or 2 through 8 that we're going to be looking at, reinforce the idea that the time of opportunity is now, right now in the present. And it says this, in, uh, in the end of verse 1, it says, In the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, for which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. In the days of your youth, Depending on how old you are, sometimes it um, you are sometimes determines how you see how old you are. Sometimes determines how you see how other how old other people are. Right? Okay. So depending on where you are, when I was a leader, um, a youth leader in my twenties, the the youth uh, of the youth group that I was serving actually threw me a 50th birthday party for my 30th birthday. Wasn't that nice of them? You know, it, it, age can be relative by what you see. The kids in Kids Cove, I'm sure, feel like the, you teenagers out there, you guys are old, <laughs> right? So they, they think you guys are old. Um, the teenagers, I'm sure, that uh, think that the young adults that are just starting their jobs and getting jobs and starting families and stuff, you guys are old, right? They're, you know, it's, age is relative. Have you ever heard the saying, you are only as old as you feel? <laughs> right? You've probably heard something like that. I hope that all of us feel young and ready to do something because actually if you look at it from the perspective of eternity we are young we are young we are only at the beginning of our lives if our faith is in Jesus Christ God wants to use as much of our life as possible whatever energy you have left whatever time you have it can be used to glorify God Verse 2 says, before the sun and the light and the moon, or, and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. I want you to pay particular attention to that first word, before. Before encourages us to get moving. Because there is a day when you may not be able to do the things that you're doing now. It goes on in verse 3 through through five, I believe it says this, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the, second, at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low, they are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond trees, tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails, because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. This is all a picture of somebody that's aging, okay? We see here someone whose bones tremble and are starting to, he's starting to lean over, his teeth are missing. The grinders are few, right? Which makes it more difficult to eat. And his eyes don't see and his ears don't hear as well as they used to. His hair is turning gray. His ambition is waning. There's a lot of symbolism in here, and I would encourage you guys to study that on your own. You can go and look at it. We're not going to get into all the details of, of these verses uh, because we don't want to miss the message. We want to hear what the message is saying. And the message is that aging has its effect on our lives. As we get older, this life and world begin to feel distant at times. All right? The reality sets in that our, particip our participation in life becomes a little bit more limited as we age. All right? For, for me, it's softball and volleyball. I used to love to play those in church league. I've, I no longer play softball at this point. Um, volleyball, I, I still play, and, but I'm much more slower than I used to be, and I, I don't die for the ball like I used to either. It's, it's just one of those things. We begin 
to age. We we sometimes get so focused, though, on our limitations. Again, verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel is broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Before, or any, any time before our life is over, it's talking about the end here. You know, sometimes we are afraid and become fearful because we feel our physical bodies, our personalities, or our past limits our abilities. Some of you have maybe noticed sometimes when I'm up here on stage, my hands begin to shake. I'm not sure why that is, whether it's because I'm just nervous, I don't, like being, I don't always like being in front of people, whether it's because of the, the snowmobile accident that I had, or whether it's just because I'm getting older. I don't know what that is. But I cannot let that stop me from doing what God has called me to do. 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Whether you are young, whether you are old, we cannot be paralyzed by the fear of not being enough, capable enough, smart enough, compassionate enough, brave enough, tough enough, kind enough, generous enough. And the list could go on and on. It's not about us. Do you see how quickly we can get off track and forget about remembering our Creator? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. The time of opportunity is now. While we still have breath, while we still have energy to do something, death will come to all of us, but it has not overcome us yet. And even though we start to see signs of aging happen, um, the reality is that aging should not discourage us, but it should encourage us to wake up and take action. Do what we can do now. God will lead and guide us if we're willing to trust in him and forget our limitations. There's a story of a man, he was driving, driving his car along a, tr- a country road, and a deer jumped out in front of him, and he swerved, to, to miss this deer, and when he did, he ran down into a deep ditch and got his car caught that he couldn't get it out. And so while he was waiting there, a, a farmer came along with, with a mule and his, and his wagon that he was, he was um, you know, just going to his farm or wherever he was going. He, he came along the road and saw this man in trouble. And so the farmer actually got off his wagon, he took his mule, he actually hitched it up to the back of the car and was preparing to, to get, um, get the car out. And he said, he yelled, pull, champ, pull. And nothing happened. And then he yelled, pull, blaze, pull. And nothing happened. And then he yelled, pull, Dakota, pull. And the horse, well, the mule pulled, pulled the car right out of the ditch. And, and so the, the guy in the car was like, what in the world was that? Why? He was curious, so he went over and asked the farmer, you know, why did you have to call your horse three different names before he would pull the car out? And the farmer said to him, you have to see that Dakota is blind. 
And if he knew that he was the only one pulling, he probably wouldn't have done anything. He would have stood there. But because he knew that there was other people, he thought that other people were there helping him, he was able to do it. And he put it, he pulled the car right out. You see, the, right, the reality is, we as Christians are not alone. God wants to use your story to bring him glory, right? Remember how he brought you from a life of sin and self-destruction to an eternal life where you will be with him forever. He's already done amazing things inside of us, and he wants to do more. He is building our character to reflect his goodness. And this will be a powerful witness to those around us. Are you going to live for the one true shepherd? Or are you going to live for the pleasures of this world that are under the sun, F-U-N? The author of Ecclesiastes calls this all vanity. It's nothing. It says the dust that returns to the earth. There's nothing that will continue in this world but that which we have done for Christ. Which brings us to our last objective that we find in Ecclesiastes 12. Follow the one shepherd. Follow the one shepherd. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. So this preacher is studying, and he's weighing all that he's learned, and, and is teaching this knowledge to other people. He is sharing the truth with others. So as we read these verses, we need to keep in mind that Jesus is the ultimate teacher, the ultimate example. He has given us words of uh, scripture that help point and direct us towards him. His words in this book, right here in the Bible, lead and they guide us. Our goal is to follow Jesus and his example. These words are to shape us and move us like a goad. Now, we've explained this in a couple of times during the series that a goad is a metal spike on the end of a stick that is used to direct oxen where they should go. But it can also be used as a protection in that when you are headed the wrong direction and trying to fight and struggle to find your own way and to go your own way, the pain of sometimes trying to kick against the one who is our shepherd helps to wake you up and get you back on track. This verse also mentions nails in it. I love the fact that they use this imagery in here. And like nails firmly fixed. I was struggling this week as uh, it's funny how sometimes messages hit home really, really quick. I was actually doing a project on my house this week and I had some nails that were firmly fixed in my house. I had, uh, there was no hope of getting them out. They were that stuck, and I ended up just pounding them in further. We, uh, it sounds like a few of you have done that before. <laughs> Couldn't get it out, just pound it in, right? Uh, we want the words of Jesus to be firmly fixed in our lives. So that when hard seasons come, they don't just pull out of our life. But they are anchored all the way to the foundation of the house, right? I'm, I'm so thankful that they use this analogy. Because it's a reminder to us of Jesus. By his own will, Jesus' hands were firmly fixed to the cross. And pierced by nail for our sin so that we can have eternal life. This image of nails anchors our mind to the price that was paid for our sin and the grace that we have received. 
I hope that this image is firmly fixed in your hearts and minds. So that no matter what comes in your life, you will remember your Creator and His sacrifice for you. Verse 11 ends by telling us these words are given by the one shepherd. When you look at the whole of Scripture, it is a continuous story pointing to Jesus Christ. And we see this here in Ecclesiastes as well. It talks about given by the one shepherd. Well, Jesus' own words in John 10, 16, he says this. He claims to be this one shepherd. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is the only way. He is the one shepherd. Zach Collins talked about this in Transform last night with the teens. That there's only one God, and that is Jesus Christ. There's only one way to get there. We must follow him. So as we close today, I want to give you three practical ways of living this out. Okay, let's read verses 12 through 14. It says this, My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making books, there, uh, there is no end. And much study is a weakness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all, ha- uh, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or or evil. The first way we can live this out is we need to get into God's Word. We've been talking about that. But verse 10 told us that the author wrote wise words of truth. Verse 12 gives us a warning to be cautious on where we get our knowledge and what we study. Okay, it says, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books. There is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. College students, I know what you're thinking right now. All right? This, <laughs> this doesn't give you the opportunity to stop studying and, and quit school. It's not telling us that learning isn't good and we don't have to study, but this warning is very timely for our day. We live in an age where there's an incredible, uh, incredible amounts of information at our fingertips. Don't misunderstand that books and podcasts and videos and and websites and the internet can be helpful. At times, it can be helpful. But we must make sure that the information that we're reading and, and putting into our lives lines up with God's Word, with the Bible. You need to be careful when most of the information you're watching is from social media sources. Jesus is the truth. So the first thing we should be doing is reading his word. The second thing that we can do to live this out, the best way for us to follow the shepherd comes from verse 13 that says this, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Did you know that psychologists have given names to just about every fear there is in life, okay? For those of you, hopefully you guys didn't experience this 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 morning with the power off, a fear of darkness is nyctophobia, all right? Some of us hopefully don't have this one either. It's a fear of being looked at by other people, is scopophobia. A fear of responsibility, <laughs> certainly hope we don't have this one, right? Is hypengyophobia? They put names to so many things. And, and believe it or not, yes, students, there is one that is a fear of school, which is school phobia. What do you know? Huh? <laughs> There's lots of fears that are out there. Matthew 10, 28 says this, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. 
the fear of God puts all other fears in their place. It's a healthy fear because God is just and a loving God. He wants what's best for you. And so we should fear him and follow the one shepherd, right? The third and last way we can live this out is we should live under the sun, S-O-N, okay? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life under that sun, S-U-N, right? It, life under, I'm sorry, life under the sun, S-U-N, will only make sense when you are living it out under the sun, S-O-N. Those who are living in the light of Jesus will have nothing to hide and nothing to fear. Because verse 14 serves as both an encouragement and a warning to us as we, as we close this out. One day God will bring every deed into judgment. With every secret thing, the darkness will come to light. So I'm going to leave us with one verse. I'm going to have the band come up as we, as we close here. Those are three things that we can do to live out our call. I would encourage you again to seek to live your life, whatever is left of it, by glorifying your Savior. No matter what health you're in, no matter what your past is, no matter what age you are, you can glorify God. You can glorify Him. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this, You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We do this by remembering our Creator, by forgetting our limitations, and by following the one true shepherd.